Welcome back. In lectures one and two, I talked about the coronavirus pandemic, discussed how it spread in less than three months to most countries in the world, and also talked about viruses, how they can be classified based on the genetic material, discussed how they can be classified based on the diseases they cause, etc. This is lecture three. And here I will discuss the immune system. So I have been studying immune responses to mosquito-borne pathogens for over 20 years, and I still learn something new every day. So right off the bat, a vaccine for the SARS coronavirus 2 will not be readily available in a matter of weeks or months. Many companies and researchers are developing vaccines based on their experience with other pathogens. These vaccines will need to be tested in clinical trials, and the successful vaccine will be those that generate a strong immune response. So what does that mean? In order to address that, we need to take a step back and learn a little bit more about the immune system. So the overall function of the immune system is to prevent or limit infection. There are numerous cell types that, can, that are in the immune system. They circulate throughout the body, or they can reside in particular tissues. For example, there are many immune cells in the lungs or in other tissues as well. Each cell type plays a unique role with different ways of recognizing problems. They can communicate with other cells and they can also perform unique functions. The mammalian immune system consists of two distinct parts, innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Cells that participate in the innate immune respond, response includes basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, mast cells, and natural killer cells. These cells are the first line of defense against bacteria, viruses, and even cancer. And the main purpose of the innate immune response is to immediately, within hours, respond to infection and to prevent the spread and movement of foreign pathogens throughout the body. The adaptive immune response takes a few days to get initiated. The main cells that participate in an adaptive immune response include B cells and T cells. B cells secrete antibodies and T cells can secrete either cytokines or also have cytotoxic molecules that can kill an infected cell. There are other cells, such as macrophages and dendritic cells, that participate both in innate and adaptive immune responses. Macrophages and dendritic cells present portions of a virus to T and B cells, and then therefore help them recognize the foreign pathogen, allowing the B and the T cell to get rid of the specific antigen. The lymphatic system is an extensive drainage network that helps keep bodily fluids in balance and also defends against infections. Lymph nodes or lymph glands are small encapsulated bean-shaped structures present throughout our body. We have thousands of lymph nodes. Typically, when you go to the doctor, if you're feeling sick, they check under your chin to see whether your glands or your lymph nodes are swollen. It is a sign of an infection. Lymph nodes contain T and B cells. These T and B cells enter from the bloodstream into the lymphatic system. And as mentioned in my previous slide, they are the most important components of the adaptive immune system and help eliminate pathogens. They are named T cells because they are derived from a structure called the thymus. And uh, they are named B cells. Well, they were originally discovered in birds uh, from the bursa of Fibricius. But one way to look at it is B cells are also derived from bone marrow. So B could stand for bone marrow in this case. So just to cap, T and B cells are significant component, components of the adaptive immune system and help eliminate pathogens. This slide shows what happens when you get exposed to a typical viral infection. We don't know if the same thing happens with SARS coronavirus, but we can predict some of it. During the recognition phase, naive T and B cells get selected. They then expand. 
Once they expand, they can get activated during the activation phase and they differentiate into effector cells. What does that mean? B cells now start producing antibodies and T cells can start secreting cytokines or they release granules that can kill infected cells. You don't want T and B cells that are activated to last too long in your body because they can then cause havoc within your body. So eventually, many of these T cells and B cells will die. But during this phase when they're activated, they can eliminate the antigen or the pathogen of interest. Once you have uh, the T cells and B cells dying off, a small subset of these cells will then live for a long time in your body. And this is the development of T cell memory or B cell memory. It's unclear how long SARS coronavirus 2 will maintain memory within a human. And that's of going to be of intense interest for researchers that can identify antigen specific T and B cells. We come in all shapes and sizes with known or unknown unique medical histories. Some of us are very healthy to begin with, some of us are elderly, some of us might have pre-existing medical conditions or are immunocompromised because we've been recently diagnosed, say, with cancer and are undergoing chemotherapy, and that makes us immunocompromised. All of us are being exposed to this virus for the first time. What's going to happen to us? So in, in a person who's healthy and young, he or she might have a symptomatic infection. So they go to the hospital, they have significant fever, cough, dry spell, and hopefully they recover. The question is, what does the immune response look in this person who is now immune and had symptomatic infection? An other person might have been really healthy, had an infection, but had no symptoms. So he's walking or he or she is walking around looking very healthy, but still had an infection. So they will also generate an immune response. And what does the immune response now look in this person? Is the immune response in someone who has no symptoms quite different from the immune response in someone who does have symptoms? Uh, the case where someone is elderly, we already know that the immune system might be compromised or weak to begin with. If they get sick, they may have an immune response, but this immune response that they generate may not be as strong as someone who was younger and healthy. And we don't know that yet, and that's what we're waiting to find out. In the case of someone who's immunocompromised, this person is going to be significantly more at risk for developing symptoms of disease and having a poorer outcome if you get exposed to the virus. So this person has to be extra cautious. And it's likely that the immune response in this person is going to be weaker compared to someone who is healthy. But we still don't know that. And we're waiting to see in a few months what the immunity looks like in individuals that have had all kinds of exposures to SARS coronavirus. But to make the point, this virus or this strain of virus, we are being exposed to it for the first time. So we have all st started out being naive and now we'll have a unique history after, if we have an exposure to this virus. I'd like to end this lecture by, by just quickly talking about a few references. So if you wanted to learn a little bit more in detail about viruses, please take a look at Dr. Vincent Racchianello's uh, videos that are available easily on YouTube. Khan Academy also has quite a few uh, lectures on basic immunology, which would be helpful to you. And if you want to listen in detail to more coronavirus updates, you can look at medcram.com or also Ninja Nerd Science. There are plenty of videos available. My intent again was to have short videos. This is already about nine minutes and I uh, hope that you've learned something about it about the immune response. And next time, what I'd like to do is talk in more detail about B cells and antibodies. Uh, thank you very much.